Good afternoon. I'm Paula Feldman, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on trends in food processing operations. I hope everyone's enjoying this wonderful snowy day. Over the next hour, we'll listen to the findings of this report by author Donna Ritson with DDR Communications, where she'll discuss top-of-mind trends such as consumer-driven trends, food processors reformulation, and evolving machinery advancements, among others. President of DDR Communications, Donna founded the company 25 years ago. DDR's business is based on a direct response methodology that delivers market research, business development, strategic alliance, and marketing intelligence to companies in virtually every business-to-business -business industry. DDR's experience is backed by over 35 years in marketing communications. I just want to give a few housekeeping notes before we get started with the webinar. Everyone is muted throughout the webinar. If you have any questions or issues with the webinar, please notice that there's a chat box at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. If you have any questions about anything Donna is reporting on or any questions about the webinar itself, please post them there and we'll respond to them as soon as we can. And at the end of this presentation, which should last approximately 35 to 45 minutes, Donna will be available to answer any questions you may have. So at this time, I'm going to hand the webinar over to Donna. Thank you so much, Paula, and thank you for that introduction. And um, I appreciate everybody's attendance in this webinar today. As Paula had mentioned, it's certainly a snowy day across the country. Um, but we're going to dive into the food processing report and look at the, uh, the trends that are going on in this industry. I'll start out here by let's just kind of get an idea and on a foundation of who we talked to. And we had 40 interviews um, and 150 secondary references. So this is very rich with information and um, top of mind trends that are going on. We talked to a lot of the leaders in the industry, certainly the, in bakery and um, uh, beverage and dairy, meat, poultry, seafood, and confectionery markets. We talked to uh, a good handful. The majority of them were their large corporations. But it's important that we also talk to medium and small companies to find out what they're doing and what their concerns are and how that um, compares, what are the similarities and differences that we look at. I think one of the most exciting things that we um, came away from this report was that healthier eating is on the rise. Um, the food market and channels and technology are certainly going to change the way that consumers in the future both purchase and consume food. Um, the traditional grocery store, it's interesting, is it's moving away from how we buy food. Um, we go to more specialty food outlets now, neighborhood markets um, that have premium products and brands, even convenience foods, which are your small retail businesses where we're maybe just drop in and pick up a couple items. That's growing as well. So where we buy food is growing. And one of the things that is significantly changing and, and how it's going to change and where it's going to go is yet to be determined, but the delivery of fresh food is, is certainly on the rise as well. Um, won't get into that in an extreme amount of detail. It's, it's covered more in the PMMI e-commerce report, but certainly going to change the way we uh, consume and buy food in the future. And, and there's cross borders, global investments um, and, and consolidation that's going on to um, position companies where they can manufacture closest to where food is consumed and certainly um, just to be able to gain um, market share in this industry. Some of the other things that are changing this industry is the environment, just how it's um, changing in terms of um, vegetation changes due to uh, water shortages, um, climate changes, um, even today's unexpected snowstorm. It, it has effects on areas that have already got food um, underway. Transportation expenses are changing it, much shorter supply chains. Um, local production is a growing trend. Um, adding bioactive ingredients um, 
from plants is certainly gaining popularity. There's a stronger competition now for just the land use. Are we going to use it for food? Are we going to use it for fuel? Are we going to use it for fiber? Um, certainly those are battling for space um, out on the land. Um, and microtechnology and nanotechnology is adding sustainability to food and improving taste, and that's going to continue to evolve. And just uh, sensors are evolving that reduce or eliminate batch-to-batch -batch variations and help us understand that the food produced was uh, done in the safest environment. And what are driving some of these um, trends going forward? Certainly consumers are driving the, the eating trends. Food processors are responding to that with reformulating some of their products. And, and evolving from that is then machine advancements that are needed to um, produce the food that uh, is changing. So what are the, some of the things that are changing in terms of global consumption? Um, it's increasing. Middle class is expected to double by 2030, and certainly that's in more of our emerging countries. Um, On-the-go eating, that's something we've heard about and continue to hear about in many different reports from PMMI. Quick preparation foods are on the rise. Um, consumers are looking for cleaner labels, less ingredients, um, and the organic um, drive and, and the organic movement um, is certainly continuing to go forward. Um, and interesting from the uh, food pro processor's standpoint, um, nearly 60% of the new snack launches were positioned as healthy. And we know as Americans, we're starting to snack more. The traditional meal and sit down for a meal, it's not disappearing, which is a good thing, but it's certainly diminishing in how we consume our food. And food processors are responding to this, um, removing ingredients um, that might be um, uh, choosing more healthier, more sustainable ingredients. Uh, fortified food additives are being added. We, you know, certainly we know protein is, iron, vitamins, calcium is being added to foods, antioxidants. Um, simplified labeling, um, looking at allergen-free, non-GMO, gluten-free, organic, the list goes on, antibiotic-free. Um, sugar is being eliminated. Um, it's, it's reducing calorie count, and it's um, corresponding with the rise in natural sweeteners that is happening and certainly corresponding to what consumers are asking for. Extended shelf life, that's always on the table. Um, and blending foods, um, different types, you're, you've seen it. Um, you know, beef jerky now is a meat product. It, it's also a snack. It's also a shelf-stable product. And then taking steps to prevent counterfeiting goods and responsibly um, reacting to recalls in the track and trace is definitely occurring. And then from the machine standpoint, um, they have to comply. Obviously, FISMA is out there with stringent food safety regulations, um, higher selective sorting, meaning the ability to have um, reduced food waste, smaller batch processing machinery, and more compact manufacturing is going on. Inspection equipment is needed to detect and separate or even um, look at small foreign particles that could possibly be in food. So equipment is really needed to have a high flexibility <clears throat> with an easier changeover capability. As it, and we'll get into some of the details of the machine needs um, as we move uh, into this report in greater detail. Um, automation equipment, combining a number of operations into one, even just the advancement of automation and machinery that reduces and conserves energy is also something that's being looked at. And we'll get into this in more detail as well, but nearly 50% of the companies that we interview predict spending more on capital equipment in the next couple of years. So. That's the, uh, the bottom line that we're looking for in terms of what their needs are going to be. If we look at this from the standpoint of the industry, it's, it's a $935 billion industry output from food and beverage manufacturers. Um, food uh, takes up $790 billion of that, with the remainder being beverage. Obviously, food is a much bigger 
um, industry with increases of almost 7% between 2012 and 2014. So what we did with this report, we took 45 of the census classifications, and that attributes to about 78% of the total value of shipments for both food and beverage. And then we compiled those um, segments into nine classifications. Um, in, so we talked to people in um, the largest segment being shelf stable, meat, poultry, seafood next, then dairy, beverage going around the circle, bakery snack, frozen, candy confection, cereal grain, and perishable prepared. So we'll, we'll talk about each of those um, in more detail as we go through here. But the map in the middle of the pie chart on the right-hand side of the slide, it shows us where the number of establishments are per state. So California certainly is the largest state um, for both food and beverage. And then you can see the green area, which has then 500 to 1,000 companies located in those states. They're definitely clustered around the Great Lakes area, um, fertile soil, good transportation. And then obviously you've got Texas and Florida in there as well as large food producers. So the global demand for food is growing, but so is food waste. Um, the United Nations predicts that we're, as a, as a global economy, we're going to have to produce 70% more food by 2050. And that demand is, is coming from, obviously, our emerging um, areas of the world, China, India, as their middle class grows. And it was interesting, um, I won't go through and, and uh, look at all of the quotes and stuff we have in here, but this one was particularly interesting because there is a lot of effort from the food and beverage industry to make our foods healthier and find the ingredients that are more natural and healthy for us. So it's, um, you know, hence the, the heading of this um, healthier eating is on the rise. We'll see that as we continue to move through this. Total global food waste, though, it's alarming. It was surprising. Um, I think the average consumer is probably not aware, but $990 billion globally is, is attributed to food waste. Um, a third of our food produced in the world for human consumption is wasted each year. Um, the highest uh, contributors to that are the cereals, your root crops, vegetables, obviously from um, spoilage and transportation issues, but oil seeds and meat and dairy comes in at 20% and, and fish as well. There's, In terms of um, these are the crops that are typically um, experiencing the greatest food waste. So what are consumers looking for? And, and, and we are the consumers in this, so it's, you know, we can look at our own lives and see how what, we're, what we eat and, and what we're looking for measures up. It, we're looking for quick and easy to eat foods, but we're certainly looking for a variety of flavors and we want a nutritional promise um, at the end of that. Um, and, and we want it to be clean labels without a lot of the ingredients that we could never pronounce and, and those are moving out of our foods. So the type of foods that we heard out that are growing popularity, certainly single serve, we want on the go, quick and easy to eat, Protein, we want our rich snacks and drinks, and, and that's evident by what's on our shelves. But we're looking for fresh products, products that squeeze, that are easy to dispense, breakfasts that are easy to eat. And ethnic foods and flavorings are certainly coming into our um, choices that we're able to make. You, you see there's not just one choice of a flavor. There's often 10 choices on our shelves now. Organic continues to grow, although that still only has 5% of the total market. Natural products, plant-based ingredients, and, and aged spirits, because we did talk to the spirits market as well, are things that are growing in popularity. And down on the left-hand side here, it's interesting to see from the top ranking segments what's growing the fastest and what's um, decreasing in growth. This is measured in the value of shipments over the last seven years. 
in creamery butter, interesting um, that that's growing, and it could be that butter is used more naturally than some of the other um, flavoring ingredients. Um, not actually able to get down to why that is growing so greatly. But breweries, we certainly know that is growing. Certainly the microbrews are on a huge incline. Um, and dried, condensed, evaporated dairy, that's where we're getting our whey and our protein that's being added to a lot of our foods and um, drinks. And what's decreasing is ice cream and frozen desserts, breakfast cereals, and flavored syrups. While they're certainly not um, disappearing, they're just not growing quite as fast. So let's take a look at the food equipment and what's needed in the future and what we heard from uh, the the participants that we interviewed. And there are certainly our, uh, opportunities for OEMs. One of the things that we consistently hear about is flexible machinery. Um, definitely continued to hear of this in each of the reports that we work on with PMMI. Machinery that can um, have quicker changeover, can be used for different sizes, um, and, and can actually have some multifunction. Um, half of the companies that we talk to predict needing processing equipment, and three of the four companies that we looked at are needing packaging equipment. And I'll just go through some of the equipment procurement needs. We'll get into some of this a little bit more detail, and certainly the full report gets into detail um, even more. But as I'd said earlier, spending is increasing. Um, the same procurement team for both processing and packaging um, is used with a, a central team of engineers and central procurement. Half of the companies we talked to, as I said, needing processing equipment and three out of four needing packaging equipment. Um, and most two-thirds of this equipment is being sourced from U.S. or domestic uh, OEMs, just faster delivery, parts availability, and service support that um, gets into a much greater detail in the aftermarket report that uh, PMMI put out last year. So what are they looking for when they're procuring equipment? Um, total cost and quality, certainly followed by ROI and service. Again, nothing greatly surprising there. There was interest in modular equipment for greater line flexibility, and OEMs are most often involved at the onset of a product development. We'll get into that in a little more detail as well. Increasing product SKUs are driving that demand for faster changeover. We hear it exponentially growing. Um, there's predictions of increasing automation and robotics. Um, four of the five companies that we talk to have more than 100 product SKUs, and over half of those people say, yes, they're going to continue to increase. The majority of companies measure OEE and look for uh, reliable machinery to improve uptime. The companies, they're focused on they're increasing their level automation. This is an area that um, PMMI will look into in greater depth uh, in the months ahead. Robotics being used now, it's significant. It's mostly at the end of the line, 94% of packaging operations, um, and increasing predictions of adding more robotics where it makes sense and where operationally it makes um, the best improvements. The majority of the companies we talk to are using vision systems. They're using preventive maintenance now, using predictive maintenance now, and three out of four companies allow at least some aspect of remote access, although there still is hesitation and tendency of going into the cloud with data or allowing um, access into their plants remotely. It is something that we continuously hear about that it will con it'll evolve, it will grow, but there's a significant amount of people that, um, at least in some instance, have allowed remote access. Over the half of the manufacturers we talk to are looking for customized equipment, and they really do look to the OEM for help with the integration. They need knowledgeable engineers to come and service that equipment and just have the ability to meet all the specifications that they're looking for. So factoring the future, what, what's that going to look like? It's going to run on big data um, using the, the whole IIoT that we continuously hear about in, in article after article of 
how to do it and where is it moving. It's improving the decision process and the planning process at plants. Um, two of the three companies that we talked to say that sanitation and clean in place takes the greatest amount of time when they're looking at changeover. Um, three of five of the companies we talked to manage both processing and packaging operations through a central engineering department. So the synergy between processing and packaging now is, is becoming more streamlined and even operationally um, handled by the same departments. And if we look at the level of integration at manufacturing lines now, over half of the companies that we interviewed have integrated their manufacturing lines, almost equal between the processing part of the line and the packaging part of the line. Um, changes upstream certainly do affect downstream operations. Production volumes are affected. Maintenance and the timing of that is, is affected, and just any type of sanitation that goes on downstream is affected as well. Um, we talked about I IOT. It's um, helping companies to better manage production schedules, manage their resources and labor, and schedule and plan their maintenance programs. Um, two of the three companies was interesting reported that they have 100% compliance with FISMA. And, and the greatest challenge in that um, exercise and in that um, the work that they had to do to comply with FISMA was through the documentation. And half of the manufacturers we talked to definitely are exploring and testing new process technologies to continue to improve their food quality output and obviously eliminate contamination and, and prolong shelf life as well. So when we look at and we talk to the people that we interview, we look to find out what, what are they looking for, what machine improvements are they focusing on and that they can um, bring that information to their machine builders Cleanability, not surprising in this industry. It's certainly top of mind to um, adhere to FISMA laws and assure that no contaminants are entering the market and um, that their uh, operations are as clean as possible. And flexibility and changeover and operator um, safety is top of mind as well. Um, having standardized controls on the machinery to work in cloud with a voice recognition, recognition feature to retrieve operating information easily. I think that that was stated very well there at the bottom by the VP of Global Engineering at one of the leading food processors, kind of taking a look at where they envision and how they're going to use um, the uh, growing data that they're able to collect. So as I had said earlier, um, end users are bringing in their OEMs and their machine builders and their suppliers early on in the process um, to help them with brainstorming, um, laying out what that application might be, and how can they best bring their expertise to the table. Um, there's a, certainly getting involved at the initial design. Um, less now when it's all the way down to component specification, the OEMs and the uh, suppliers have been brought in much earlier in that stage to help them make more efficient machines and um, move through their changeover processes quicker and help them with any customization that they might be facing. Operational improvements in the next three to five years certainly do focus on increasing automation. And as I said, that's an, a topic that um, will get explored in much more detail in terms of what, what exactly um, are they doing in terms of operational improvements to add automation to their process and, and what does that mean down the line. Um, cost savings is also top of mind. That's not surprising. Labor reduction, that's why automation um, is increasing. And the whole workforce development um, is, is another reason why automation is increasing. As in, uh, throughput needs to go up, and we need to, as we'd heard from United Nations report, be producing more food in the future. 
So when we looked at, um, we didn't get into this in depth in this study because the brand protection and product traceability gets into the whole track and trace um, all the way through the entire supply chain. If you haven't seen that report, it, it is quite thorough and walks you through all the way from um, farm to table type tracking. 1D barcode is, is going to continue to anchor this in the future for tracking um, incoming ingredients into the food manufacturers, as well as um, tracking that through their process and through their distribution. Um, 2D barcodes, though, it, it definitely is growing. It's growing faster in the pharmaceutical industry, but it's also growing in the food industry because it can hold more information and have a greater level of traceability. And it is the QR codes that interact with the consumer, although from some of the findings that we have found, QR codes are not being highly adopted and highly used by consumers, but um, I think that that will continue to evolve as the information and, and what we look for in sourcing continues to grow. RFID, it's more used internally, it's used at the carton level. The predictions of RFID never took off, um, but it's certainly a technology that has its place uh, mainly in internal tracking um, as well. So let's take a look here now really at building that relationship um, with the suppliers and between the end users and the OEMs and, and what they're looking for. As I'd mentioned earlier, two of the three brand manufacturers that we talked to manage both processing and packaging operations through one central department. Um, that departments are consisting of VPs of operations, production, engineering, manufacturing, plant director, um, all play a vital role in keeping that line moving all the way from processing through packaging. And the majority of the companies also have a common procurement team that is both for processing and packaging equipment as well. So they're looking at the total operations of a food manufacturing facility, um, both in processing and packaging. And as I'd said earlier, those are um, becoming more synergistic in terms of the people involved and the, uh, the management that's managing that whole entire line. IIoT and data collection, again, it's for production schedules and resource and labor and maintenance. Um, companies are looking for real-time data. They want a system that can integrate machines from disparate hardware online, measure losses, and generate actions to fix them. They're looking for causes of downtime. They need to increase throughput and manage batch control, certainly optimize waste, hopefully eliminating waste where um, possible, looking at raw material inventory coming in, productivity trend analysis, lots of different things, labor staffing. They're using this data for a whole host of things, um, all the way down to scheduling their repairs and, and financial planning. So over half of the companies that we talk to are um, using customized equipment. Um, they're moving to more strategic partnerships. Some of the companies that we talk to are decreasing their engineering staff. Hence, there's more re, uh, reliability and, and um, emphasis on building that relationship with the OEMs and leveraging what expertise is in the industry. And they look to the OEM for a variety of services with integration, with engineering services, particularly if their engineering department is decreasing, knowledgeable based engineers. They need to meet the requirements and, and specifications for custom applications. And one interesting thing here, too, is willing to solve issues on all equipment. They were looking for OEMs to be able to come in and not only help them necessarily with um, the equipment that they're working on, but have an understanding of the operations in the uh, entire process and packaging lines. So if we look at what's ahead, certainly clean labeling, it's, it's, it's here, it's, 
it's moving in that direction. Ingredient modifications, the food processors are removing ingredients that um, might not be as healthy and replacing that with healthier choices and looking just towards healthier foods in general. So bridging that um, skills gap, it's something that um, PMMI is, is deeply involved in with other associations. It, it's, it's national in terms of um, what's occurring. So we talk to these um, food processors about what they're doing to help bridge that gap between um, new entry engineers coming in and those leaving the workplace. Place. So one of the things that they really talked about was training and developing training skills to be able to make up for that loss of experience. Um, I was at a conference this week where it was very interesting presentation about Clemson University um, at the forefront of some of this training and really having the expertise in the processing and packaging industry um, helping to develop some of these training skills. Very interesting something um, to think about in terms of how the OEMs are, are developing the materials that are going to help their machine users to transfer that knowledge from a, um, a new engineer to moving them to become a more skilled operator or a more skilled engineer. And some of the things that the industry is looking for is equipment that's easier to use, it's more intuitive, and certainly, as I had said, more training programs and details on the operation of that equipment, and just a more standardization and, and simplifying of the procedures and processes on some of the machines that we, uh, they're using now. So when we look at what's most critical in the years ahead, this is an, it's part of our conversation with them to just kind of focus them in on what are they looking at specifically and particularly. You know, product quality, it, it's top of mind. It's being driven by FISMA, obviously. We heard that the majority of companies that we've talked to are FISMA compliant. Those laws have been in place now for a while and are, are um, many of them are in place in terms of the regulations that are being enforced. Operational efficiencies, that's always top of mind. And retaining skilled labor. This, in all of the conversations that we have, and, and we do proprietary research as well, retaining and finding and training skilled labor is one of the top three that we consistently hear about. Um, maintaining product quality and consistency, certainly looking for um, replacing any unsafe ingredients as we've covered, minimizing any food risks, being able to track their product through if they do find themselves in a recall situation, being able to get that uh, data immediately and get those products off the shelf. Um, tracking incoming ingredients is, is an area where there is a gap in the tracking process, um, and the industry is working on improving that and just getting raw materials during shortages. Um, when there's a shortage of a material, it does um, open up the door for opportunities of crime and counterfeiting, so managing those shortages and understanding where those materials are coming from is extremely important. Um, and then just dealing with new product rollouts, um, finding that next great snack that um, consumers are going to want to have, that's what these food processing companies are looking for. And achieving operational efficiency, certainly calculating OEE is important, and they look to the machine builder to help them with those calculations and providing that data that's accurate and accountable. Um, footprints. In the, in the uh, manufacturing facilities are getting more and more under con uh, uh, smaller, I should say, in terms of having the space available to um, increase capacity but still be able to meet demand. Um, maximizing uptime, that's, that's a given. That, that's what they're running at. They want to run with um, only minimal downtime, preventive maintenance scheduled in there. 
ROI is extremely important in helping them understand how to um, justify and increase automation. Um, greater support and parts from offshore OEMs is certainly um, something that's on their top of mind as well. And as I already talked about, retaining and um, finding and training labor is, is at the top of their list as well. So opportunities um, to provide uh, sanitary, intuitive, and flexible machinery is what food manufacturers are looking for in the year ahead, um, even in the years ahead. Um, they're, they're looking for the highest sanitation equipment design that's possible, um, focusing on um, that sanitation documentation as well. FISMA mandates um, require careful documentation of their cleaning procedures, so they're looking for that um, equipment that's easier to sanitize and um, document. And one of the interesting comments we heard, too, from one of the engineers was, don't rush machine designs to the market to make sure that it's, it does have the highest sanitary design that it possibly can have. And then also justifying the expense of automation through ROI so that they can upgrade um, to more automated machinery and have ROI that can justify that purchase as well and assist in, in helping them build that case um, for ROI and preventive maintenance. And intuitive auto, automation equipment with improved longevity, they're looking for diagnostics and data sensors, intuitive tools and ways to save time and money, and again, hearing simplifying machines um, so that less human error uh, is entered into the equation. And flexible machinery and customization, we've talked about this, we hear it consistently. The word flexible is used um, synonymously with several different meanings just in terms of um, being able to have a variety of pack counts and sizes that they can move through the same machine, better design strategies that are needed um, just for the variance in sizes and styles and materials that they want to put through their machines, and to really look at customization in this area as well. More standard communication platforms. We heard, uh, heard about the PACML as a va uh, valuable tool in standardizing some of these platforms. So. I know that that is something that uh, continues to move forward in the industry. So opportunities to form stronger relationships um, between the OEM and the food processing. Um, they're looking for attentive customer service, certainly that's a given, strong product knowledge, and interactive training in the years ahead. Um, so they're looking for, you know, in terms of better customer service, educational programs, consulting services, understanding their regulations, helping them reduce the, the paperwork, but also be efficient in terms of track and trace, and production and validation requirements are needed, um, expert product knowledge from OEMs on their own equipment to provide scientific proof that machines can reliably accomplish certain tasks certainly under different types of machine usage and parameters. And one of the things requested was more rigorous testing and documentation at this stage so that they have assurance of the machine that they're looking at is, is going to perform in the way that they have anticipated. And to be able to share that engineering information and application stories um, that show productivity gains um, preventive maintenance documents for all equipment is needed, um, what inspections are performed and how often do they have to do that, share information on equipment, especially on the longevity and the tolerance times um, of spare parts and when they're needed and how long they'll last, and providing upgrades on equipment that have already been done possibly at another manufacturing site and sharing those um, good practices and um, helping them gain that knowledge without having to start from scratch. Better technical training tools to assist the operator, this looking for more detailed instructions, videos, 
um, online training, anything that can help emphasize training and help them adhere to the cleaning protocols that are needed and any capabilities to reduce contaminants and, and how that gets done and how they transfer that knowledge from one to the next. And interesting, some of the um, interviews that we heard about and, and, and talked about in our interviews was scheduling more customer visits. Um, end users were open to that, um, particularly if they have aging equipment to know how do they handle that in the future, how do they begin to plan for um, a succession of that equipment, and, and how are they going to just take the time to understand the constraints and the complexities that the manufacturing plant for, floor faces. So as we kind of to to the end here, um, some of the things you'll learn in the full report, it, it gets into far greater detail um, exploring the trends um, in technology and clean labeling and healthier eating, equipment procurement and what functionality is needed and the regulations and standards. There's more information in here about FISMA, which we know is, is well underway, um, but it gets into a little bit more about challenging um, specifications that were needed and tracking incoming ingredients, and then how that actually impacts manufacturing. So in also the full report, um, the nine food processing segment categories that we talked about earlier being bakery and beverage, confectionery, grains, dairy, frozen, meat, poultry, seafood, which is shown here on the right, and fresh, prepared, and shelf stable. Each of these markets has a detailed example like I've shown here on the right for meat, poultry, seafood, which meat, poultry, seafood is getting a deeper dive study right now through PMMI's um, committee, and um, that's a report that's going to be coming out um, in the next couple of months. But what you'll find in the full report on each specific product segment is their size, how it's broken out, what some of the food and the production trends are that are going in that particular industry. It looks at some statistical data. It compares value of shipments to the material costs in that specific industry. It also then compares the number of employees to the number of establishments and how that is possibly changing in each of these industries. And then it looks at CapEx spending and it compares it to leased spending, which in some industries, and I won't get into the details here, but some of those industries um, are changing in, in terms of value of output and um, capital expenditures and leasing. And then each of the uh, nine food segments has some of the consumer habits that are driving uh, trends and changes in those industries. And then we give some examples of some food categories, some innovation going on in each of those industries. So it's, it's rich with information about each industry specifically and, and the value that you can get depending on uh, which industry you're particularly looking at. And, and kind of the foundation behind this is we do continuously hear from the machine users and the food processors and the packagers, that they really are looking for their OEMs to understand their business better, N know what they're dealing with, know what their problems are, and, and some of this detailed information that you can find in the full report will really help give you an understanding of each of these industries in more depth. And then we also went out and we look at what is the industry saying, what are the statistics saying, what are our, our food regulators saying, and we compile this information into this report and a lot of the statistics that you've heard today. And we have the references um, organized by each industry, so you can go through that if there's more in-depth information that you're looking for or want to research something in, in greater detail um, that's organized um, very easily uh, through this uh, reference at the end in the full report. 
So I do thank you for attending um, and listening in on today's food processing webinar. I'm going to turn this back over to Paula Feldman for any questions um, that were asked during the presentation and, and to have, um, you know, give you information on how to download the full report as well as getting some of the fact-filled resources that the PMMI Media Group puts out. Thank you, Donna. There's some great insights you provided us on this report for the Trends in Food Processing Operations. A couple of key points that I noted were the critical concerns being the product quality, the operational efficiencies and retaining skilled laborers, and then providing that sanitary, intuitive, and flexible machinery in the years ahead is what they're looking for. So I'd like to open the session right now for questions. Um, so you can enter any questions you may have in the chat box at the left-hand corner of your screen. And we do have one question that goes back to slide seven, Donna. It was about um, what is the source of the wholesale value of the shipment data that is represented on slide seven? Um, uh, from slide seven, well, yes. that, that information what came from the United Nations. Um, so that was that obviously not something that we uh, talked to about in our interviews. All of the statistical data on um, the value of shipments all comes from the Census Bureau data. Um, and unfortunately, our census data does not uh, stay incredibly trendy in terms of timeliness. Um, but, it, but when you look at trends over time, um, that's what we're really looking at projecting is, is trends over time as opposed to year-to-year -year changes. Um, so all those references do come from secondary sources. That's great. Thank you. Now, as Donna mentioned, we are working on a meat, poultry, seafood report that will be coming out in a couple of months. But before that, we will be releasing a global packaging trends report. Um, we'll have a discussion on that next week at our ELC conference, Executive Leadership Conference, that's going to be held in Florida. And if you're not already registered, please quickly go online and register for that. And keep an eye out for the email that's going to be talking about the Global Packaging Trends Reports, I would say, right after the ELC. So on behalf of PMMI, thank you for participating in today's webinar. We don't seem to have any other questions, Donna, but I do want to mention that this report is chock full of information that was not able to be contained in today's webinar. So please go online at pmmi.org slash research to download the report. And as a final note, you will receive an email today to complete an evaluation for the webinar. Let us know how we're doing, how quick we can improve the, the webinars, how we did in today's webinar, and what topics you might like to see research done in the near future. And Donna, thank you again. Great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.